you all for coming. I'm uh, very pleased to present to you today uh, Professor Harold Abelson from MIT. Uh, Harold, Hal is the class of 1922 professor of EECS there. He's uh, very well known for many contributions to education, uh, both with and about computing, uh, starting from early work with Logo. Uh, some of you may have heard of turtle geometry. If not, something to look up. Uh, uh, everybody here, or, or maybe a, a lot of you know about structure and interpretation of computer programs, a really landmark uh, introductory programming course. I should say that's a, a, a very uh, uh, personally meaningful uh, item to me. I was a, a freshman a few years ago taking <laughs> Hal's uh, course, a, a prototype version of, the, of that course, pre-scheme. Uh, I later uh, graduated to become a TA for that course, uh, which was really, taking the course was probably my, my first exposure to the intellectual depth of computing. Uh, teaching it was maybe my first experience of the rewards of, of teaching computing. So it's uh, been a, Hal's had a big role in shaping uh, my own personal path. Uh, in, uh, in recent years, uh, Hal has been very active in the uh, border between information technology and policy. He was a, a driver and leader in uh, MIT OpenCourseWare, um, active in Creative Commons and the Free Software Foundation and, and uh, many other uh, related initiatives. He has been uh, highly recognized for uh, many of his contributions. I'll just name a couple of the more recent ones. Uh, in 2011, uh, he was named ACM SIGC, that's the uh, Special Interest Group on Computer Science Education, the outs for outstanding contributions to computer science education. And in 2012, he was named the ACM Carl V. Karlstrom Car Outstanding Educator. Today, he is our distinguished lecturer, and he's gonna take us from computational thinking to computational values. How? Okay, there's, the mics are working, okay. Um, thank you for that introduction. In fact, it's quite, it's quite nice that you started talking about Logo because that's where I'm gonna start too. And I'm gonna give a little bit of a, a, a little bit of a self-indulgent uh, history and try to take the things that you mentioned and give you a sense of how they fit together, at least in my head. Uh, I want to say I, it's a tremendous treat to give this talk at Michigan because I think Michigan is one of the places where everything I'm going to say is obvious because you guys, more than, than almost any other place in the world, have the sense of a university as having institutional values and where what I'm going to be calling computational values are very close to the kind of thing that you guys have been doing. So you can take this as almost a review and realize that in many of the places I talk, these ideas are not accepted and are not shocking, and are considered shocking. But let me at least start with, in my own intellectual journey, starts with Seymour Papert. You, some people have had the, the privilege, as I have, to actually know Seymour personally and work with him. Uh, Seymour started the Logo Project, and he wrote a remarkable paper in 1971 called Teaching Children Thinking. Logo was this completely outrageous idea that you should take these computers, which cost millions of dollars, which were used by very large businesses and by the Defense Department, and that could be something that kids could use for education. And of course, now everybody yawns because it's completely obvious, but this is 1971, right? People thought we were totally insane. Maybe they were, maybe they were right. But Seymour wrote this great paper called Teaching Children Thinking, and it said that computing and these computational, these machines could be a source of intellectual empowerment for kids. And one of the things that, under Seymour's guidance, starting as far back as 1969, 1970, we were trying to say this is about having, not just about a, a machine that can do something, 
but it was about a way that kids and all people can see themselves as intellectual agents. And for me, that, for me that's where it starts. Um, one, you kindly mentioned my, the book I did with Jerry Sussman, where the theme really is about computing is a revolution in the way we think, that computing programs are a way to express ideas. And that, that, that took off and started, just started this notion that it's not just about getting a machine to do things. It's a way for expressing ideas. And then I think some of you know that that a few years ago, Jeanette Wing, when she, was, she was, when she was head of the size directorate at NSF, wrote a very influential paper, paper called Computational Thinking, which said part of making people, part, part of what we, do, what we do as a discipline has some tremendously important ideas in there, like abstraction, like the ability to think about processes and recursive structures, like the ability to define things behind APIs. And she, this paper became very, very influential. If, you, uh, if you've done anything in the computer education world in the last oh, four or five years, you've probably run across the, the term computational thinking. But what I want to talk about is there's more than that. There's the notion that this really isn't just about these ideas we teach, in, we teach in our classes, but there really are some values there, some values that have to do with empowering people, that it's not just about the ideas sitting out there, but it's, it's the notion that people should actually be able to get their hands on them. And uh, I'd like to say that in this, in this digital world, which as we all know is just starting, that there's the opportunity that people can use what we know. We as computer science teachers, and this, this talk is really addressed to those of you who are students, advanced students, those of you who are on the faculty who are thrilled by these ideas and want to share them with other people, that we can do that and we, that we know something very special. And it's not only, it's not only about computational thinking, it's about the values that go along with those. The values, the values that say that, that this stuff we know should be a force for empowerment of everyone. Not just sitting back and, and appreciating the notion that there's something like recursion, but, this, but people should be empowered in the digital world because that's more and more the world in which everyone lives. Uh, let me give you an idea. Let me show you something that for me, and I bet many people here have seen it, just exudes this notion of computational values. And that's the Google Ngram viewer. How many people have seen that? Yeah, terrific. Um, right, so you know what that is. It says I can, it says I can search uh, however many books Google has digi digitized, some reasonable fraction of all the, of all the printed books. And I can look at things like frequency of occurrence of words. And they're, they're just marvelous things you can do. So here from, here's a graph from 1960 to 2005 of some terms. Right? So the red, the red is a graph of the frequency of educational computing. And you can watch how that's risen and, oh my god, fallen. Right? <laughs> and uh, the, the blue one, if you really want to feel bad, is a graph of the term computer science education over the last 20 years. So looks like we may have a way to go. But anyway, you can do all sorts of great things with the Google Ngram viewer. Um, and I don't know how many of you know about this, the culturenomics work. How many people know that? This is, this is just, yeah, this is just, just incredibly beautiful. You take this massive corpus of books, and then you start doing some analysis on it. And one of the things you, look, you can look at, many things of course you can look at, is you can look at how people are mentioned in the literature and you can take that as some measure of their popularity. So for example, if you look at the second one, Dan, um, that blue line that starts around 1933 and kind of goes slowly up, that's Mickey Mouse. 
That's how much Mickey Mouse is mentioned in the, in the published literature. The, the red line's interesting, that's, that's Che Guevara. So you see who hit a lot of popularity and, and then comes down the, uh, let's see, the, uh, the pale blue one, uh, the bottom pale blue one there is Neil Armstrong. And you can sort of say, how, how much were people in the, in the public mind over a period as measured by just counting the number of times they appear in this giant corpus, corpus of books. And then you can do other things. You can say, let's look at the, the top, I think it is 70 most mentions political figures. And let's see how much they were mentioned. And that's this red line. So you can kind of see political figures kind of rise meteorically and then kind of stay up there. As opposed to uh, authors the blue line here that rises kind of a slow, slow slope. So the different professions have different kinds of characteristics. Um, this purple one here is authors. And that can tell you something about American culture. And the one you really want to see is this yellow thing that slinks along the bottom. That's, that's mathematicians. So you, can, <laughs> so you can get some sense of our culture. And now you can go on and do, do even more kinds of analysis. You can say, look, if we average people getting, getting popular and then losing popularity and then make some kind of, of curve that averages them, there's a half-life for how fast they rise and there's a half-life for how fast they fall. Okay, so there's some sort of average people becoming popular and then being forgotten. And then you can look at how that average is different for the different cohorts. And what you see is the rise time and the fall time Decrease the ha the half life decreases as you go as you go from uh, from say 1930 to 19 1980 and what's that mean? Well, that means that as a culture we're getting faster. It says people get famous faster than they did uh, 60 80 years ago, and people get forgotten faster than they did 60 or 80 years ago. That's now a statement. So it's just amazing. This is a statement about the evolution of our culture. And it comes out of just counting this, the, the number of times that people are mentioned in, in published books, if you have enough books. And I want to introduce a word that maybe some of you have heard, is the notion of a generative platform. A generative platform is something that can be used for things that the people who created that platform did not anticipate. So you have to think about, there was a shift with Google Books from thinking about books as individual works to there is now a thing called the corpus and we can ask questions about the corpus itself. And that is an example of generativity because the, the the authors and the publishers who put this thing out just sort of never have a, had a clue that their stuff could be used for this whole other thing. That's, to me, a marvelous example of generativity, right? Can be used for things that the original creators did not intend or did not anticipate. Okay, and then again, there's some other experiments going on with this. There's an equivalent experiment that was going on at Harvard. I don't quite know what happened to it about tracking uh, the, the change in language in physics papers over the last 50 years. But you can imagine experiments like that. Uh, so there's a whole notion of generativity. I'll return to that later. When I, when I, I'll, I'll return to that later. But let me just start again with just another another thread I want to put in this lecture. And this one goes back, oh gosh, 10, 11 years, which is forever in internet time. And those of you who thought about computing education will remember that there was a device that, that appeared 11, 12 years ago that was totally going to revolutionize all college education. Right? And that was, of course, the Apple iPod, not the iPad, the iPod. And some of you might know that as part of this revolution, Apple made a deal with Duke University to give every entering freshman an iPod. 
And what they were going to do with this was to record and share uh, lectures and other educational materials. Okay, we're gonna record and share lectures. Uh, what happened was that all the upperclassmen at Duke got completely pissed because the freshmen were getting these free iPods and they weren't. So Duke went back with Apple and renegotiated this deal so that all the undergraduates got a free iPod and everybody was happy. And this is an article, this, this is an article in the Chronicle of Higher Education that's talking about this and how everybody was happy, but there was a problem. Because it turned out that what the undergraduates were doing with these iPods was recording and sharing lecture material. And out of the woodwork pops a friendly intellectual property attorney. So isn't it wonderful how a friendly intellectual property attorney always manages to pop out of the woodwork with, uh, do they have permission from the person who wrote those lectures to share them? And professors should be aware of how easily this stuff could escape to the internet. Okay? And I, I read this, and I just had this vision, so some of you will be old enough to recognize this. My God, it was, it was Napster, right? It's Napster for academic <laughs> works. What a, what a, what a horrible idea. And then, again, some of you will remember the era when the recording industry was sending, sending threatening letters to colleges saying your undergraduates are downloading all this stuff and suing people. You know, and I saw this in the MIT Tech. And I imagined, you know, in my warped imagination, suppose it was this, right? <laughs> and the thing to realize now this was my warped imagination, you know, five, six years ago when I thought about it. But now in the world of MOOCs and online proprietary stuff that's happening, you can easily imagine this sort of thing happening. So it hasn't happened yet, but you can imagine it. It's no longer, it is no longer a joke. Uh, let me show you another example, my favorite example. Again, back to ancient history, 2001, when the RIAA was sending out threatening letters because, because uh, students were, were threatening the basis of civilization by sharing Metallica, Metallica chords. You, you, you remember that, right? So you had, and this letter went out from the in the University of Southern California to the to all the USC students. And this is one of the most remarkable statements I've ever seen. Just imagine, right? As an academic institution, USC's purpose is to promote and foster the creation of intellectual property. Right, just think about that. But this, is like, this is like sent by a real university administrator. Right? Now, I would have thought that as an academic institution, USC's purpose had something to do with education. <laughs> but, 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 apparently, but apparently not. Um, and I think what we all have to appreciate right now is that there is a struggle going on for the soul of the university. And the struggle is there is a whole part of the world that wants to look at what we do as kind of producing certain kinds of goods. And the appropriate way to think about how those goods should be stewarded and kept is through this lens of property, in particular intellectual property. And to me, that is a real threat to the values that we do. And at least we should be aware of it. So what can we do about it? One of the things we can do is we can move from computational thinking to computational values to computate what I want to call computational actions. And to me, Michigan is a place for, that as I look at does computational actions. 
and that's why I really love being here. Um, one of the ones that we did at MIT around the turn of the, turn of the century was MIT Open Courseware, where the MIT faculty said we were going to take the materials that we create for our courses and we're going to put them up on the web uh, for free forever for everybody. And we put up a whole bunch of things here, right? So we put up not only the lecture notes, but, but the problems and the solutions. And we got a lot of mail from, from faculty around the country saying, boy, thank you, thank you for putting up all those problems. Please take down the solutions. <laughs> and, and we'd write back and say, no, this isn't about you you using the MIT course. It's about you creating your own stuff. Uh, open courseware today has gotten pretty, pretty popular. Our original goal was to publish all MIT courses. We don't quite have all, but we're really, really close. MIT has about 2,000 unique courses. This includes, and of course, there have been a lot of repeats. So there are about 2,000 active courses that are up. There are a lot of translations that, are, that have been made. There's, uh, for places that don't have good internet access, there are mirror sites, and we, we ship out we, we ship out uh, we ship out discs. Uh, a lot of the MIT faculty participate. You remember you have to bear in mind that this is completely voluntary, and so one of the, one of the things that we wanted to do when we started it was we wanted to get it into the culture that you'd put your course material on open courseware, and we've done that pretty well. Uh, it's got a lot of usage around the world. Uh, what's interesting here? There's a lot of visits from inside MIT. So MIT is not a very big place, but to get 162,000 visits from inside MIT is kind of saying something. It's saying we, we ourselves use this very much. Um, half the traffic's outside North America. Anyway, we, we keep statistics like this. But this was never meant to be an MIT-only operation. When we uh, got funded by the Mellon and Hewlett Foundation, we agreed we would set up something called the Open Courseware Consortium which was a whole bunch of universities that are kind of united in this notion that you should put your course material online. And that's, that's kind of evolving along. They went up over, under a Creative Commons license. So Creative Commons was a thing that I'd worked on at about the same time, which said these are licenses designed to go along with your material that you put on the web. And there's a selection of licenses that you can use. And then, uh, then when you select a license and put on it, that license comes with metadata. So some computer program can say, oh yes, you can download this, you can maybe use this totally for totally however you want, or maybe you can use it for non-commercial use, or maybe you can't make derivatives. Anyway, that's, that's the Creative Commons licensing language. And this whole movement or bunch of stuff MIT and, and, every, and lots and lots of other people has come to be called open educational resources. And it's this vision that the, one of the things you can do with the internet is take the products of you know, great universities like ours and make them available to all of humanity. Right now the Hewlett Foundation is kind of the main proponent of open educational resources. But you see, even in, in uh, stuff coming out from the White House, and there's a, actually there's a big, uh, I think a $10 million grant by the Gates Foundation to develop curriculum under the condition that it put out, that it gets put out under Creative Commons share-alike licenses, or share, just Creative Commons licenses. And it, so we, we in starting Creative Commons are just really happy with how this has gotten taken up. When we first were making Creative Commons, uh, and we sat around at some table, I think, at a meeting at Harvard and said, what's success? We said, oh, success might be there are a couple of million places that are using Creative Commons licenses. And now I forget what it is. It's in the hundreds of millions, and it's becoming the standard way to share is to use these licenses. So that's, that's very gratifying to us. Um, and of course, now we're moving into the world of MOOCs. So for those of you who have been watching it, that's, a, that's Coursera, which is the, the largest collection of universities putting up course materials. At the moment, people can register for the courses for free, 
the course material is not Creative Commons free that's being worked at. We don't know how this is going to happen, right? This is a movement that started, for those of you who know everything is about MOOCs, you should remember that 18 months ago, no one knew what that word meant. So we are at the very beginning of another, another shift. Uh, there's MIT's, MIT and Harvard and Berkeley and University of Texas and a bunch of other places are, are also making some big shared online educational thing. Uh, here's Udacity. Udacity actually to me is the most interesting of these for those of you who are looking at the, the online MOOC world because they seem to be the least wedded to the idea that what they're putting up are semester courses. But, but anyway, there's a whole experimental world going on. What's not clear in this experimental world is how the licensing and sharing will go. One of the things we might all think about is in 2001, it was very easy to say, for a university to say, we're gonna put up all of our material for free. Just because there weren't any business models, one of the things we should all be asking ourselves is in 2015, are universities going to be as willing to put up their course materials for free when there are business models? And I don't know what the answer is, but it's really something we should all watch. Uh, enough of open courseware. The other, the other thing that, that MIT did is we made an institutional repository called DSpace. And I certainly don't have to tell folks at Michigan about DSpace, because you've got one. You're one of the very early early partners and developers of, D, of DSpace with Deep Blue, and I don't have to explain it to you. It's the notion that, hey, the university has the responsibility to take the publications, the research publications of the faculty, and put them up in some, in some repository, and Michigan is, is a great, great worldwide leader in that, so I don't need to, don't need to explain that to you. Uh, DSpace, by the way, went out as, as free software. And one of the things that's easy to do is if you want to put up a repository for your own institution or company or something, you can pull down the DSpace software and build a repository on that. And here's a graph of, there are lots and lots of, of instances coming. They're now, they're, right, they're now uh, you know, over a thousand DSpace instances. Again, of places that are that having the idea that you should, that the institution should be the place that shares its, uh, its publication. And DSpace has morphed into something called DuraSpace and merged with this other thing called Fedora Commons. And uh, it's, all, it's all a very nice story of, of things that are taking off. And these are two companion visions. One is the open courseware vision, which really says that, that there really should be universal access to the course material of the great institutions of learning. And the other is the, the DSpace vision, which says there ought to be universal access to the research project products of the great universities. And this one has turned in these days into what's called open educational resources. And this one has turned into the, mo into the movement for institutional art repositories. Okay. So that ends the introduction to this lecture. Because <laughs> what I really want to talk about is why. Why should universities support things like open educational resources and institutional repositories? And one reason is that if we don't do this, we're going to find that academic values are increasingly marginalized and stressed. And I'll give you my favorite example from this. Uh, with apologies to Ben, I'm gonna make fun of, of Georgia Hopper, right, who was is, who, who, who is general counsel at UT. So here's a problem. I teach, we all teach, um, and what I like is that students sit in my class and take notes. But you realize, or I realize, that if students are taking notes and they are 
writing down more than just the bare facts and maybe capturing some of my, my unique expression, they are engaged in copyright infringement. I mean, how can I deal with this? I, want, I really do like it that students sit in my class and take notes, but how can I condone this, this illegal activity? So this came up at the University of Texas, and the general counsel at the University of Texas came up with the right solution that you'd expect a general counsel to do. <laughs> which is to say, of course, faculty member, what you ought to do is get students to agree to a license. And even they even had the suggested license, right? These are my lectures. They are protected by state copyright law. They've been fixed in a tangible medium. Uh, you're authorized to take notes in a class, and you understand that you're creating a derivative work of my, my lectures, and you're authorized to use this, uh, what does it say, making one set of notes for your own personal use and no other. Right, can you imagine? Right? Right, Sally, what did Professor Corper say in class yesterday? Oh, I'd love to show it to you, but it'd be copyright infringement. <laughs> right? This is the kind of craziness that you get into when you start thinking seriously that what we're engaged in in the university is the production of something like intellectual property. There's a wonderful book about this. It's, it's pretty old by now, but it's wonderful by by Corinne McSherry, who these days works at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. This was her, her dissertation at Stanford Law School, where she talked about the, the fights over who owns academic work. And comes up with this, what I think is, is a wonderful insight description of what's going on, that you know, we really do care about our stuff. We want to, we believe in its, we, we, we believe it should be wholesome, we don't believe it should be denigrated, but the only vocabulary that the United States replies for, uh, has for those. The only framework is talking about property. But the more that faculty get trapped into this rhetoric of saying this stuff is intellectual property, the more that the university simply becomes a place of production and the more that faculty simply get judged on, on their economic value and the more, the more the whole notion that I think we all share of transmission of culture and, and, and education becomes marginalized and turned into something else. Let me, let me expand on that a little bit. Um, what's, what's another reason why we should care about doing things like, like open educational resources and repositories? Because if we don't, we are going to be shut out we are going to be shut out of basically decisions about the future of the disposition of knowledge. And I really mean that. It's, it may sound very extreme, but I really do mean it. Let's, let's look at this paradigm of our publications, of scientific literature as property. Right? How does it work? Let's, let's, let's put on the, the glasses that say this is about property. And let's describe what scholarly publication is like. And the answer is um, some faculty member creates property, and then you give that property away to a publisher. You give it away. It used to be your property, and now it is their property. And that sounds pretty weird, right? The, the publishers now own this property forever, or you know, 75 years past your death, or whatever the duration of copyright is. And because that sounds so crazy, they will magnanimously allow the authors to retain some limited rights. And the university, basically, which is maybe the place that helped fund this or in the environment where it happened, gets no specific rights here. And if you think this had to do with the public, you're, on some, you're just on some other planet. The public doesn't, doesn't go into this doesn't enter into this deal at all. That's what scientific publication looks like from the perspective of saying it's property. And I mean it literally, right? How do you give your property away? You give your property away by signing a copyright transfer agreement. That's what copyright transfer is. It says, I am going to give this property to the publisher. 
and we all sign it when we want to go publish. Um, and it's a contract. I mean, it's like a real contract, not some stupid piece of paper that you have to do at the very last day when, you're, when you've edited your thing and you've got to put it in the envelope to the journal. You are signing a contract. And that contract basically determines, can you use this thing in teaching? Can you talk about it? Can you post a copy on the internet? And typically, these, these, the details are determined completely by the publisher. Here are some rights that are generously granted by Elsevier. That, gosh, if you publish a paper as a grad student, you know what? You can use that paper in your thesis. Isn't that great? If Elsevier didn't allow you to do that, you couldn't. You can, you can, uh, you can present that paper at a meeting. Right? If you didn't have that, your talk would be a derivative work of this thing that is now Elsevier's property. So Elsevier grants you the rights for that, and you can post a personal version on, on a website of, of maybe just, sometimes just the text. Right? So that's, that's the nature of this agreement. Uh, here are here's some from, uh, from Wiley Blackwell. Right? Isn't this great? You can post the original manuscript prior to peer review. So these are the generous rights the publisher gives you to this thing that you might have thought was your paper. You can reuse for non-commercial publication and up to 250 words of text, <laughs> right? So these are the, this is what Elsevier is claiming, the law says, but is it That's Wiley Blackwell. Well, Actually, well, but Elsevier. And the other one was, was Elsevier. But is it, is it the actual fact of what the law, the case law is? I mean, has anyone oh, ever I want, been presented from? Ex excellent, excellent question. And there's a lot of confusion about it. There's a sense, <clears throat> you have to realize, there's a thing called the copyright law, which is c determined by Congress. OK? But in this example, you have signed a contract. And as far as US law occurs, if you want to, if two consenting parties sign a contract, that's a contract. This has nothing to do really with copyright law. This is a contract that you, there are, few, there are very few things, there are very few what are called inalienable rights in the United States that you may not contract away. You can't, you can't sell someone your arm. You can't sell yourself into slavery. A few others, but, but other than that, this isn't about copyright and law and law. This is you have agreed to a contract. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked, because there's a lot of confusion about that. Um, anyway, this is Wiley Blackwell. In other words, what's going on is we're moving towards private monopoly control of the scholarly literature. And I really do mean monopoly control. If you look at scientific publishing over the last uh, decade, it's been a story of consolidation. So, so Wiley... Wiley grew by sixfold in the last 10 years. Uh, Elsevier gobbled a lot of stuff. We went, we went in from a situation in, in 1998 where there were a small number of players to 2008 where in scientific publication there really are only four companies. So it really is about, you know, just like we talk about media consolidation in the United States, there's, there's scientific publishing consolidation. Um, the other thing that happens, I mean, for example, when Wiley acquired Blackwell, since everybody knows this stuff is so, is so valuable, they paid 18 times earnings for that. And one of the things that's happening is the journal prices are now reflecting the cost, those acquisition costs. So another phenomenon, other than there's monopoly control of this, is that the journal, pro the journal prices are skyrocketing to pay for this acquisition activity. Uh, here's MIT over a decade. I don't see any reason why you would be any different can ask your libraries. But basically, this, uh, that sort of dark, really dark black, black line, that's the consumer price index over a decade, uh, 1986 to 2004, two, two decades almost. Um, that's that black line. That red line 
is what the MIT libraries spent on, on journals. And everyone's getting more journals and it's cool and everything, but the, the number of journals published is that green line. So it's not that they're really way more journals. And then you could say, well, you know, paper's gotten really expensive. <laughs> so uh, if you look at the, uh, the less dark purple line, that's what the MIT libraries have spent on books, and the yellow is the number of books. So it, it, ain't, it ain't that paper's getting more expensive or production's getting more expensive. It's that what you're seeing is flat out monopoly consolidation and pricing. Right, what's it mean really? Um, I don't know, you, gotten, you must have gotten letters from the library saying which journals can we blow off, right? Libraries have a real, real problem here. Their costs are going up at three times, at three times the rate of inflation. Um, what's it mean concretely? If you want a subscription to theoretical computer science, these numbers are about two years old, um, right? You could buy a nice, really nice plasma TV for one year subscription to theoretical computer science. If you uh, are in a, 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 you know, theorists don't make a lot of money, right? They, right? <laughs> if, we, if, we, if we find a little, a, a, a little sexier thing, right? If you look at applied mechanics and engineering, now you can go buy a pretty good car for the one year price of subscribing to that journal. Oh, and by the way, I ought to say, I'm not even supposed to show you these prices because these prices are individually negotiated between the publishers and the libraries, and the libraries are supposed to keep them secret. So don't, don't tell anybody. Um, <laughs> but you know, we, we computer scientists, we're, we're, just, we're, we're, just, we're just low life, right, compared to some places. If you want a really good car, okay, you have to subscribe to something like brain research. Right, right. Where twenty? I mean, do you believe that? Over twenty thousand dollars for a one-year subscription to one journal. But, but of course, you know why it is, right? If the libraries came to you and said, uh, you know, we're, we're going to we're going to stop our subscription to theoretical computer science, you'd all scream. And certainly, the biologists would would just kill if they said we're gonna stop, we're, we're gonna stop uh, subscribing, subscribing to brain research. So there's no, it, this really is a monopoly position. You get an entrenched place where there actually is no, no price elasticity or infinite price elasticity, whatever you, you call it. Now how can this persist, right? So you look at this thing and you see, my God, how can this possibly happen? Right, you don't get paid for, putting it, for publishing something, you don't get paid for reviewing something. How is it that the prices are so high? And the answer is really pretty simple. It's that the way the, 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 the paper publication system is structured right now is that it is a dialogue between the publisher and some poor faculty member who's trying to get tenure or a graduate student who's trying to get a PhD thesis or something and you have no negotiating power at all. Right? Congratulations, you can either sign the copyright agreement or you can't publish your paper in the ACM journal. What are you going to do? Right? The total empower balance. So what has to happen is there's got to be some kind of collective action on the part of faculty. You saw some of it, some mathematicians uh, started by Timothy, Gro Timothy Growers who got the Fields Medal, which is the, the Nobel Prize of Mathematics, got fed up with this and started a boycott. And that got, got a lot of news, um, right? There's a place you can go still. What's the number here? 50,000, 60,000? I remember how, people, how few people signed it. You can go to thecostofknowledge.com and you can go sign the thing which says, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna publish in Elsevier journals. But then you have to mean it, right? So that, that's one thing you can do. There can be boycotts. The other thing that can happen and is, what happened, I think, first at Harvard, actually first at University of Southampton, and then at Harvard, and then at MIT, is the faculty actually passed a, uh, a resolution which say that when you as a faculty member publish something at MIT, prior to even you having written it, MIT has non-exclusive rights 
to use that for non-commercial purposes. So this is prior to any kind of copyright agreement or, or publication or any of that. It's just part of being a faculty member at MIT. This was passed unanimously by the faculty, which means that both faculty members who attended the faculty meeting voted for it. <laughs> right? We know how it goes. Right? Um, we have an opt-out permission because we had to opt out in order to get you know, really pretty wide-scale unanimous vote. So people can opt out, but you opt out on a per publication basis. But the presumption is that MIT can use this stuff for non-commercial use, which typically means put it in DSpace. Okay. And then the chairman of the faculty says the kind of wonderful things that chairman of faculty say when this happens about how the wonderful values of MIT. I would love to see Michigan do this. Please do it. There are a bunch of places that, are, that have open access mandates. And it would be wonderful to see Michigan as part of that. And your, your provost, ex-provost, is, is a champion of this sort of stuff. So, you know, it's a thing to try and do. It has to come from the faculty. But there's also pushback. Right? There's pushback. And uh, one pushback is coming from Elsevier. So Elsevier, if you look at the actual publication contract, it spells out rights you can do. I showed you that before. And in 2010, they amended that to say, well, you have the right to do that, except if you happen to be at an institution that has one of these mandates, is what that turns in. So it turns out that, that faculty from, from MIT and Harvard and a couple of other places actually have fewer rights retained when they publish something in Elsevier publications than other places. That's one kind of pushback. Um, so there's a war going on. And it's about real, right, real fights, real money, real lobbyists in front of Congress. I'm confused. You're talking about places like Wiley and Elsevier and so on. And then you threw in a remark about publishing in ACM. Which side is... Did I say publishing in ACM? I thought you said ACM. I don't remember if I did, but I'll say it anyway. It's, the society is ACM, be very careful. I, I want to... Let, let me not get dragged too much off track, but many, many of the societies, not ACM, many of the societies, their publication stuff has gone bankrupt and been bought up by Elsevier. ACM is not. ACM is independent, and ACM has, a, again, a pretty hard policy in the ACM Digital Library. They have recently put in some kind of measure where you can, on your web page, put up effectively something that will authorize people to go to the ACM Digital Library and get your paper for free. And we've had discussions with ACM about this. ACM's in a very tight spot because 35% of ACM income comes from the ACM Digital Library. And they're sort of saying, we're stuck. But let me, let, let me get, we can go back and talk about that later. It's a, anyway, I was saying there's a, there's a fight going on. And now there's pushback to the pushback. So on Valentine's Day, there was a bill introduced in Congress called, uh, called uh, Fair Access to Science and Technology Research, which would extend, effectively extend the current National Institute of Health policy that says within a year, year, six months, after you publish something funded by NIH research, that has to go in some kind of public access thing. So that happened on Valentine's Day. The uh, Association of American Publishers said what came back and said what you would expect. And there's a great lobbying war going on in Congress right now. And that's where it is. Except, as I was preparing this lecture, shut up. As I was preparing this lecture, on Friday, last Friday, this amazing thing happened, which is the Office of Science and Technology Policy put out a new administration directive that this doesn't have to be approved by Congress and takes an effect right away which says every federal agency that funds more than uh, $100 million worth of federal research has to make a plan for 
that's like the NIH one that says all of the publications funded by that agency have to go up in some kind of open access archive. And I don't quite know what to say. It's been you know, exactly one working day since this memo came out. And uh, we'll all see what happens. We can, you know, hopefully we will all support it in the, the fights to come, in the pushback to come. But this is a real, real, real change. So. Uh, some of the publishers are pushing for some other kind of policy where you have access for six months for free. And then, in perpetuity, they keep the rights to the publications. If you missed it in the first two months, it will be paid for. There, what's going on is all the publishers are scrambling, and they're all doing all sorts of different things. But in any case, this is a real, real, real change, and it's a, a chance to get involved with what's happening. Um, there's a, right, so this is new, right? This is last Friday. We can all congratulate ourselves, but you know, this is like the real world, and there's another shoe to drop, and another shoe, and another shoe, and another shoe. So we need to keep alert. Let me move to something else. Another consequence of these publication agreements are the way they are licensed to your library. So when your library uh, licenses stuff from Pacer or various places, there's a prohibition on doing indexing. So, I don't know if you're like me, but if you think about generated systems, this totally drives you nuts because it means a thing like the culturenomics stuff that I showed in the beginning, where you say, oh gosh, you know, it's not about individual articles, it's about the whole corpus. It's locked out. You just can't do it. Right? So, for many of these, public, many of these publishers, open access means you can go sit in front of the web and get one of these journals one at a time and an article one at a time, but you can't do all the data mining you know, that we, of all people in the world, know is incredibly, incredibly valuable. That's getting locked out. Um, there's the actual words in Elsevier. You cannot use a web crawler. You can't use a robot to go get this stuff. And, you know, just think of all the research grants that you want to you want to run out and write. That's that's analyzing all this stuff. It's a tremendous world that's simply locked out. But Elsevier, of course, is not stupid. They know that there's that there's value there. So they have an operation called Science Direct, which can give you APIs, which which has APIs that allow you to access the corpus in a different way. But of course, it's not generative, right? Because you're 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 being restricted to the API that Elsevier has provided. And this is not a generative platform. So this notion of generativity may actually get stillborn when it comes to the scientific literature. Um, there's a wonderful book that I hope you've all read, with one of the greatest titles in the world by Jonathan Zittrain called The Future of the Internet and How to Stop It. And what it's about is the importance what Jonathan says, he's at Harvard Law School, he says, the real thing that's made the internet take off is generativity. It's, it's the fact that the network is generative, and even if you look at the PC industry, right, uh, the PC for all, all of us sort of beat on Microsoft for being an evil monopolist, the PC turned out to being a generative platform because Microsoft never said you can't write a program and, write it and run it on a PC. So the PC, for whatever Microsoft made for it, the PC allowed other people to make other kinds of software that would run on, that would run on the PC, and that was a kind of generativity, and according to Zittrain, that was very important. That's what Zittrain was saying in 2008. <clears throat> Last year, two years ago, this is what Zittrain was saying. He's saying the PC industry is dead. That generativity is dead. Why is that generativity dying? Because we're replacing the mode in which we write software that gets distributed in many, many, many different ways from things that are distributed through app stores. The distribution mechanisms for software are becoming concentrated. And we're getting software distribution is now becoming a walled garden. 
And as a says, if we allow ourselves to live in these walled gardens, even if now they seem kind of, kind of, kind of okay, eventually you're under control of the gardener. And you're back in, and that just kills generativity. Uh, right, so for all the apps that are floating around, for, for the iTunes store, and the Amazon store a little bit less, and the Google store a little less. Nonetheless, you have to, somebody is controlling what that distribution mechanism is if you write software. And so what happens, the network effects in software lead to monopoly positions. That leads to concentration of the distribution channels, and that leads to decline of generativity. And that's what is happening to us and our business in writing software right now. Okay, let me try to pull this together. And the thing I want to ask is, are our students going to be in a world where the platforms they work with are generative? Right? Are, they going to, are they going to be able to really, to really tinker with this infrastructure the way that all of us kind of grew up assuming that when we learned about computers, we could tinker with them and we could kind of do what they wanted. There was something that it was limited only by our creativity, not by somebody who could control what could go out there. Uh, let me show you a nice example. There's this nice kid-friendly programming language, which you may have heard of, which Apple said, you may not put in the Apple store, you may not distribute this thing because Apple has some policy about distributing uh, software that has built-in interpreters. So anybody know what that is? That's, that's MIT Scratch. So MIT Scratch is this wonderful piece of stuff that's done at MIT. It is not permitted to be on, on the iPad, for example. Right? This is just a very, very weird world. So, you know, will our students be able to tinker with the kind of wonderful infrastructure that we are experiencing building now, is it losing its generativity? Is it losing its approachableness? I think, let me just end with a little bit of what, what I'm working on. I'm sort of asking, gee, is mobile computing going to be generative? Because mobile computing is kind of, you know, these are wonderful little gadgets, right? But they're coming out as, as, as consumer products with closed things, with, with closed, concentrated places where you distribute apps. So what I've been working on, just as a s small advertisement, is a system that says kid, all kids should be able to program apps for their, for their phones. This is on Android. I'll give you a hint of it. Here I'm going to make a little app. Uh, I have, here's a phone that's connected to the computer, and I'm gonna say here's a little design space, and I pull out a button, and as soon as I pull out a button, that button appears on the phone. And I say, gee, I'm gonna make this button look like my cat, by saying its image, its image will look like, that really is my cat. Um, I'm gonna put in a little piece of sound that's a cat's meow, and then I'm gonna say, I wanna program the thing so that when I press the button, the cat will meow. And I go here, and there's a blocks a blocks interface language, and I drag out the little block that says what to do when the button clicks. And I drag out the little thing that says the thing that plays music should, should play the uh, cat meow. And I put that there, now I'm done. At that moment, if I touch the phone, the cat will meow. So that's just a tiny, 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 it's not even hello world, it's, I'm imagining hello world. But you can imagine how an environment like that makes, thing, makes things easy. Um, you know, the phone also knows, has a location sensor, and that location sensor uh, attacks to it, goes to a geographic database, so I can say also when you press the button, have a label that says the phone should say where it is. So now, you, that's, that's exactly how hard it is to build an app. It's done, it's done now. But uh, you can find out more at uh, appinventor.mit.edu. It's a little, little hint of what, what we're trying to do. Um, with that, I'll end, but I do want to say that I, hope, that I hope you'll get is that I want to leave you with the thought that those of us who teach computing today know something very, very special. And it's not just recursion is powerful, which of course it is. 
it's that there's this sense of power that people can get by having some control over this infrastructure. It's this sense of computational values. It's this idea that the infrastructures that allow us to do all of the things that made us love computing were that largely because they were generative, generative platforms. It's the notion that this is really precious and it's something that we should not lose and that we better keep aware of if we want our students to have the same kind of, of wonderful experience and awakening in computers that we do. So thank you. Mm -hmm.